Wow. That's a nice introduction. Thank you. I was going to make everybody breathe with me anyway, but this is even a better start. So what my lab did is we created the first ever lab-grown lungs, human lungs, um, in the world. It took us 15 years to get there. So I'd like to say it one more time. We made lab-grown lungs, which is, to me, a phenomenal thing to this day. I still don't believe that we accomplished it. Yeah, it's like, woohoo! We say that every day. I want to tell you a little bit, though, about what it's like to do work like this, because it's not enough for you to understand the research side. And I will show you, whoops, how we made the lungs. But I want to tell you a little bit about what it's like to do cutting-edge research. I will tell you, honestly, it's always like standing at the edge of a cliff and looking off and knowing that you have to jump, that nobody did this before. And there could be good things down there, not likely that there's chocolate pudding. There's probably bad things down there, maybe snakes, at least there are some rocks. You don't know what it's like when you get there, but you know you have to go inside yourself and just let go and make that jump. Doing cutting-edge research is also very much like being on a seesaw with an elephant at one end and you at the other. You know how big that elephant is. It's an unbelievable problem. It's, it's a huge thing to try to achieve. And everybody you meet at meetings that you go to, cocktail parties if you talk about what you do, which I try not to, they look at you and you say, what, is, what do you do for your, your, you know, for your job? And I say, well, I'm a research scientist. And my lab is trying to bioengineer human lungs. And they just kind of look at you and gently walk away and <laughs> pretend they need to go get a drink. But pretty much doing, doing this kind of high-risk research is difficult. Scrutiny of your work is higher. It's harder to get our publications um, through and recognize and get the information out in the world because nobody believes you did this. Nobody did it before. We don't look like we're anything special. So why would, we, why would you think I would be able to do this on my research team? It's also hard to get funding for high-risk research. And this is something that if we're going to have a brave new space in the future, I would hope that we find ways to nurture this kind of work and not do what people do when there's something new, which is be afraid of it and try to pretend that, you know, the person's crazy, you're going to walk away from them. So to do this kind of work, you really have to have an idea, a vision, which is the path that takes you where you want to go. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your research team. And you have to just give it a chance, knowing you're probably going to fail along the way a lot of times, but that's OK. My students hate to hear me say that, though, that you might fail. They think it's a terrible thing. And I'm like, no, failure's an opportunity to get back up and try again and do something different. It's actually a good thing. So why did we decide we wanted to try to create lungs in the first place? Well, lung disease rates are rising worldwide every year. People have long waits on transplant lists, and some of them die before they receive their lung for transplantation. Donor lungs are always um, difficult to procure. They're hard to find in general. We, we're always going to have a short supply. And even worse, for the most underserved population for children, pediatric lungs are, ne are really never available for transplantation. So we do something that I think is slightly barbaric, but my surgeon friends say that this is reasonable and I have to trust them, is we take a larger lung and we staple it and we cut it down to fit into a child, if we can get one to fit. And so that's why we figured we wanted to try to do this. So our idea was, what if we could make small, medium, and large-sized lungs for people that needed them, when they needed them? That's a great idea, isn't it? It sounds like something that's too hard to believe. But basically, our plan was to try to take different types of cells that could be enticed, stem cells that could be enticed to become lung cells, adult cells from, from other lungs that we could get a hold of and work with them, and synthetic scaffolding materials to try to grow lung tissue. And what we found was we failed a lot doing it that way. So we said, wait a minute, let's, let's go back to this and let's, let's try a different way of doing this project. I want to let you know something about procurement of the tissues that we work with, because we're very fortunate. We work with human lungs that are not suitable for transplantation. The cardiothoracic surgeon we work with procures these. 
They're for research use. Four of those lungs were pediatric lungs that couldn't be transplanted into children because they were too damaged, and so the parents wanted something to good to happen out of their loss, and so they asked if we could take them to work within our research project. We also work with pig lungs. These are procured as part of a tissue sharing program. We've never euthanized an animal just to, to take lungs to work with. And occasionally I get them from the butcher, but I think he thinks I'm making some kind of special ethnic sausage, so don't say anything <laughs> about that. We started small. You have to start somewhere. So we started with rat lungs, and we said, what if we could take damaged lungs that had no viable cells in them, and we could use that to make a natural scaffolding material that we could actually bioengineer lungs on. And so what you're looking at right in front of you is in a small bioreactor chamber, this one's commercially available, is a rat lung that we're treating with detergents and chemicals that remove all of the blood and all of the cells to produce something that looks like this. It's the skeleton of the lung when you take all the cells away. It still looks like a lung. It's a blank canvas for us to paint on it and produce our bioengineered tissues on it. So that's what we talk about when we say we use a natural scaffold. High-risk research, you never have ever any equipment made for you. We are constantly making things that we need in the laboratory out of other things you might find. So the first bioreactor we produced, as we scaled this up to work with pig lungs or human lungs, was made from a fish tank bought from a pet shop. Was used, and we used plastic from the boating industry, which can be easily sawn and cut it into any shape we wanted to, and the pumps we used in the system were bought on eBay. Everything else that was made up, this bioreactor, the plumbing inside, came from the hardware store plumbing department and cost us about $12. So that's our first bioreactor. But the good news is, is that it worked. This um, image that you're seeing in front of you, this little time-lapse movie, it used to take us 14 days to take a rat lung and turn it into an acellular or decellularized scaffold. This time-lapse movie was made by Jason Sakamoto and my research group, and what it shows you, and it is still working, it just is a slow process, all the cells are being removed, the pink areas are not pink anymore, and as this liquid comes down, you see how white and glossy that lung is. That's the scaffold that we're going to use to bioengineer our lungs on. It looks like this. The trachea still exists. The Main stem bronchus, the bronchioles still exist, or at least what used to be those structures, because we took all the cells away, just the proteins are left behind, the proteins that are made by the cells that the cells actually attach to. The vascular system is intact too, but there are no cells. It's not patent. If you put blood into it, it's going to leak all the way through it. But at least the base structures are there for us to reconstruct and build upon. So what do I mean that the structures are there? Well, the alveolar spaces are there. As you image from the outside of one of these lungs into it, using this technique, what you can see are those nice spaces that exist. Those are the air spaces in, inside of your lung, the alveoli. So that when you breathe and you pull that air in, you fill those air spaces so gas exchange can occur. That's what your lung does. That's the function of it, to allow you to breathe oxygen in and to breathe out waste products that you don't want to have. So that's the kind of structure that's a good thing that we still have it. So what is that stuff made out of anyway? Well, it's made out of protein components. It's made out of collagen, which is very strong. It looks like uh, green strands of wavy hair in this image. And elastin, which is a stretchy rubber band-like material that interlaces like knitting a sweater through those lungs. That's the material that the scaffold is made out of. And it's amazing, because every time you breathe, the strength of the collagen supports that breath, and every time you exhale, the elasticity lets that lung pull in to make it easier for your body to push the air out. And if you all take a minute with me and breathe again, breathe it in and out, that's an amazing process in itself. And by the way, we do do that a lot. And regardless of if you know how many times a day you breathe, it's a good thing that you still are breathing. So what does this look like if you go down the trachea? If we take a little camera and we go down the trachea, we go to the branching airways, this looks absolutely normal, you can trust me. Um, 
The only thing that you don't see here, if any of you have ever seen an image like this before, there are no blood vessels anymore. It's not pink, it's white. And as we come up upon the point here that the airways branch off, you can see all of those branching airways exist. Or all of the extracellular matrix from those branching airways is still there. Again, no cells. For the blood vessels, again, no cells. But the branching network of blood vessels that's an integral part of the lung is still there as well. It's amazing. These scaffolds are just beautiful. That's part of the process, though is getting the scaffolds that we need to produce these lungs. We also need to have cells. And so I mentioned to you that um, we use lung cells periodically. We use adult cells from the lung itself. Occasionally we get lungs soon enough that they still have living tissue. And so what we do is we take those lungs apart and collect the cells because normally we would throw these lungs away anyway. And we take those cells, those live cells, and we use them to reconstruct or bioengineer a new lung. If you look at this picture, the pink color tells me that those are lung cells, they're pneumocytes. The blue color in the middle is the cell nucleus, and the green color you see surrounding that whole cell, those are what we call adhesion molecules. Think of them like little suckers or sticky feet, because it's really important for when we recellularize a lung and put new cells into one of these scaffolds, that those cells are capable of attaching to the material. So how do we recellularize? I can write it out for you, it takes like 10 pages to describe it, but pretty much if you just look at the image, what you see is an arrow showing you where a catheter is run. This lung is a human lung, a single human lung, it's upside down, trachea is at the bottom. And what we do is we have a procedure that we follow, just like a recipe that says, on this day we put in this growth factor, on this day we put in this cell type, and we reconstruct the lung that way. We also use blood vessel cells. We collect them the same way we collected the lung cells. We, we carefully dissect out any of the blood vessels that still have living cells in them. We scrape out the lining of those blood vessels. We collect them. We clean it up. We evaluate what they are. We treat them with growth factors, and we put them in the pulmonary artery. They come out the pulmonary vein. And what they do, if you look at that image of what's the naked scaffold material, is the cells using those adhesion molecules attached to that scaffold. Okay, the other part that's amazing about this process in terms of the attachment is there's some mechanic sensing kind of capability like a zip code thing that tells the cells where they need to go. That helps too. Also, nanoparticles that contain growth factors can be put in there and kind of entice the cells where you want them to be. But bottom line is you take something that looks like a scaffold on one side, which is glossy and white, you add the cells back in, and you get a living lung that you can actually do testing on, what's called pulmonary function testing, put this lung on a respirator and see how it works. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we do. In this picture, you're seeing the scaffold and see how stiff it is? It's not moving very much. There are no cells in it. There are also no surfactant protein, something lung cells make to make your alveoli pop open better. Kind of like yeah, the first time you go to blow open a balloon, it's really hard, but the second time it's easy. Surfactant does that for your alveoli, makes them pop open easier. But if you go to the next image, and I'm sorry this jumps at the beginning where the videographer didn't know what he was going to see, and it kind of startled him. But if you watch this, this is pulmonary function testing of that lung I showed you a minute ago. And you hear us in the background, I'm sorry, we, we didn't really need to have the voice overlay. We're so excited we can't stand it. Um, we just stood for a long time watching this lung on the ventilator. It's live tissue, by the way. It's still bathed in some of the nutrient material we use to grow the lung in. And we all just stood there and watched it expand like that. That's beautiful. That's yep. And I was waiting for that comment from my research partner where he says that's beautiful. By the way, it certainly is. So. We did um, three-dimensional CTs, so we did PET CTs, we did CTs to kind of get an idea of what these lungs that we're engineering look like. What was really exciting to us when we did the reconstructions of this is that the, one on, the, the lung on one side that just showed this red, that's the reproduction of the vascular system. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. On the right, the yellow -ish tissue that's over it, the yellow color, that's the lung tissue that's grown back around it. So it's really important to know that to get gas exchange, you need a vascular system and you need the lung cells in really close proximity.
You need to recreate the capillary beds that need to be there, that were there before. So that arrow is pointing at a red blood cell and a section of normal human lung tissue. That's not the engineered lung. On the other side, the pretty green and red one, that's the bioengineered lung. Instead of pumping through this red blood cells, which you would look at it and say it looks like the thing on the other side, you wouldn't believe me, we engineered it. We pumped in a dye that's mixed with a hydrogel. Um, it's the stuff that makes toothpaste thick so that it squirts out and stays on your, on your brush. This hydrogel, when it's mixed with the dye, which is a red dye, we pump through the pulmonary artery and out the pulmonary vein. So everywhere you see a green endothelial cell or a blood vessel cell, you see that it's hugging one of these areas of red, and that's exactly what endothelial cells do in terms of forming capillaries. You get this effect where the, the, the um, blood vessel cells surround this capillary, and you can see how thin those walls are. You can believe that gas exchange could occur in that structure if it needed to. So what's the next step for us? Um, every country in the world requires preclinical studies before you go to using these, these tissues or any material that you're developing or medical device that you're developing, you have to go through a series of preclinical studies first. For us, these studies will answer a lot of questions. Will the lung that we have grow with the animal if we put this into a young animal? That would answer the problem for pediatric transplants. How well will this lung survive? Will the tissues act like normal tissues? And although they came from an adult and we put them into a younger animal, Will they still act normally and survive for the lifetime of that animal? Those are the kind of questions that we need to answer along the way. Because in terms of what we're trying to get to eventually is clinical use of these tissues. For pediatric lungs to start with, probably for compassionate use, because many children die because we don't have an organ available. And I want to tell you something. It's hard work to take science fiction and make it into science fact. And, and this work is always tremendously difficult. But if you have a team that believes in what they're doing, then anything we can think of, we can do. And those are the kind of ideas that we want to spread around. And by the way, I will agree with you when you look at this lung, which is the second lung we produced, that that's a breathtaking picture. And someday, we hope that will be breath-giving as well. These are the people that do the work. Some of my, I, my team is in the front row here. Um, they came with me to Vienna because they were going to see this through all of the way. Unfortunately, my research partner of 15 years, Dr. Joaquin Cordiella, who has lung disease, couldn't make the trip. He wasn't allowed to fly this time, but he's here in spirit anyway. And I want to thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs>